This is Space Time Series 22, Episode 60, coming up on Space Time. It may take longer for Earth's poles to flip than previously thought. Astronomers find traces of one of the universe's very first stars. And a Chinese space station falls back to Earth. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. A new study suggests Earth's magnetic poles may take far longer to flip than previously thought. A new analysis reported in the journal Science Advances shows the process may take up to 22,000 years to complete. That's more than twice as long as the 9,000 years previously estimated. There's growing evidence that Earth's magnetic poles are about to flip. The North Magnetic Pole will become South, and the South Magnetic Pole will become North. The last time this happened was some 770,000 years ago. Now, when it does happen, it'll be the first magnetic field polarity reversal in modern times. And that raises some serious questions about how today's technology would cope with the change. To us mere mortals on the surface of this revolving planet around the sun, Earth's magnetic field seems steady and true, reliable enough to navigate by. Yet, largely hidden from daily life, unless you're a pilot, the magnetic field drifts, waxes and wanes constantly. When I'm flying, one of the first things I do when I get in the cockpit of an aircraft is to readjust the cockpit's compass to the latest readings for true north. For years, the magnetic north pole was wandering around parts of northern Canada, but more recently it's been careering towards Siberia, which recently forced the global positioning system, which underlies all modern navigation, to update its software sooner than expected to account for the shift. Now, on average, the magnetic pole shifts and reverses its polarity roughly every 250,000 years or so. But with the last one occurring some 770,000 years ago, we're long overdue for the next flip. And there are some early signs that a possible pole reversal may be about to occur. The accelerating movement of the North Magnetic Pole is one sign. Another is something known as the South Atlantic Anomaly, a weird part of the South Atlantic Ocean between Brazil and Africa where compass needles go nuts, pointing south instead of north. And it's not just compass needles that are affected. The South Atlantic Anomaly region causes Earth's inner Van Allen radiation belt to move closer to the Earth's surface, dipping down to just 200 kilometers in altitude. This results in an increased flux of energetic particles in this region, exposing orbiting spacecraft to higher than usual levels of radiation. In fact, the International Space Station required extra shielding just to deal with this problem. NASA has reported that modern laptops have crashed aboard space shuttle flights as they pass through the anomaly, and the Hubble Space Telescope doesn't do any observations while it's passing through the anomaly. Whether or not the South Atlantic anomaly really does mean Earth's poles are about to flip polarity is yet to be seen. The problem is, scientists have only a very limited understanding as to exactly why the field reversals occur or how they happen. Now, new research by University of Wisconsin-Madison geologist Brad Singer suggests the most recent field reversal, 770,000 years ago, took at least 22,000 years to complete. That's several times longer than previously thought. And the results further call into question some controversial findings that some polar reversals could occur within a human lifetime. The new analysis is based on advances in measurement capabilities and a global survey of lava flows, ocean sediment and Antarctic ice cores, providing a more detailed look at a very turbulent time for Earth's magnetic field. Over millennia, the planet's magnetic field weakened, partly shifted, stabilized again and then finally reversed for good to the orientation we know today. The new results provide a clearer and more nuanced picture of reversals, at a time when some scientists believe we may be experiencing the early stages of pole reversal. Mind you, other researchers dispute the very notion of a present-day pole reversal. Singer says, unless you have a complete, accurate and high-resolution record of what a field reversal really is like, it will be difficult to discuss the mechanics of generating one. We know that Earth's magnetic field is produced by the planet's molten liquid metallic outer core as it spins around the solid iron inner core, generating powerful electromagnetic currents through what's called a geodynamo. This geodynamo creates a field that's most stable, going through roughly the geographic north and south poles, but the field shifts and weakens significantly during reversals. 
We know this because as new rocks form, typically either as volcanic lava flows or as sediments being deposited on the seafloor, they leave a record of the magnetic field at the time they were created. And geologists can survey this global record, piecing together the history of magnetic fields going back millions of years. The record is clearest for the most recent reversal, that one 770,000 years ago. For the current analysis, Singer and colleagues looked at lava flows from Chile, Tahiti, Hawaii, the Caribbean and the Canary Islands. They collected samples from these lava flows over several field seasons. Lava flows are ideal recorders of the magnetic field. They have lots of iron-bearing minerals, and as they cool and solidify, they lock in the direction of the planet's magnetic field. The researchers combined magnetic field readings and radioisotope dating samples from seven lava flow sequences to recreate the magnetic field over a span of 70,000 years centered on the last reversal. They found the final reversal was quite quick by geological standards, less than 4,000 years but it had been preceded by an extended period of instability that included two excursions, which are temporary or partial reversals of the poles, stretching back another 18,000 years. And that's more than twice as long as suggested by other studies, which claim reversals wrap up within about 9,000 years. The lava flow data was corroborated by magnetic readings from the seafloor, which provide a more continuous but less precise source of data than lava rocks. Singer and colleagues also used Antarctic ice core samples to track the deposition of beryllium, which is produced by cosmic radiation colliding with molecules in the atmosphere. You see, when the magnetic field is reversing, it weakens, allowing more radiation from space to hit the atmosphere, producing more beryllium. Since humanity began recording the strength of the Earth's magnetic field, it's actually decreased in strength by about 5% per century. And as records like Singer shows, a weakening field seems to be a precursor to an eventual field reversal, although it's far from clear that a reversal is imminent. A reversing planetary magnetic field would significantly affect navigation, as well as satellite and terrestrial communications. But if the current study's right, it means society would have many generations to adapt to what would be a lengthy period of magnetic instability. I'm Stuart Gary. You're listening to Space Time. Astronomers have found the ghostly remains of one of the universe's very first stars, buried deep inside an ancient star on the other side of our galaxy. The findings, reported in the monthly notices of the Royal Astronomical Society letters, are based on observations of a distant star 35,000 light years away in the Milky Way's galactic halo. The star, named SMSS J160540.18-144323.1, is a red giant dating back some 13 billion years, and it contains chemical signatures suggesting it was made directly out of one of the first stars to shine in the universe. One of the study's authors, Dr. Thomas Nordlander from the Australian National University, says the parent of the star they discovered would have had about 10 times the mass of the Sun and, as a result, probably didn't live for very long. He describes the discovery as a cosmic time machine looking back to the universe's earliest stars. That's because the pattern of elements found in stars today can reveal traces about their ancestry. Nordlander says the long-dead progenitor star probably exploded as a fairly weak supernova. Now, the first stars to form in the universe were made up almost exclusively of hydrogen and helium. They're the elements originally created in the Big Bang 13.8 billion years ago. These first stars are referred to by astronomers as Population 3 stars. They were all thought to be extremely massive, many tens of times the mass of our Sun. Being so big and hot, they would have burnt through their nuclear fuel supplies very quickly. The explosion also seeds the space around it with elements generated by the star during its life and in its death rows. And the more recently a star is born, the higher the percentage of these elements available for its manufacture. Stars produced out of the remains of those very first Population 3 stars are still mostly composed of hydrogen and helium, with only trace amounts of heavier elements, which astronomers refer to as metals. These stars are known as Population 2 stars. But as they die and seed the universe with their own remains, more and more of these metals become available for future generations of stars. For example, our local star, the Sun, which is a Population 1 star, is, based on its metallicity, probably made up of up to 100 generations of other older stars. Norlander and colleagues compared the pattern of elements in the star they found with predictions for what would be created in a Population 2 star when a Population 3 star exploded. 
The authors think the supernova energy from the original Population 3 star when it exploded was so low that most of the heavier elements fell back onto the dense remnant of that star, a neutron star. Only a tiny fraction of elements heavier than carbon escaped into space to help form that very old Population 2 star that Norlander and colleagues found. In fact, that Population 2 star turns out to have the lowest iron level ever recorded out of any stellar discovery ever made, indicating it was born just one generation after the universe's first stars. In fact, the incredibly anemic star, which likely formed just a few hundred million years after the Big Bang, had iron levels 1.5 million times lower than that of the Sun. In this star, just one atom in every 50 billion is iron. It's like a single drop of water in an Olympic-sized swimming pool. The iron deficient star was found using the ANU Sky Mapper and 2.3 meter telescopes at the Siding Spring Observatory in rural New South Wales. To find out more, Andrew Dunkley is speaking with astronomer Dr. Fred Watson. This ancient star um, could be the oldest one ever discovered. Yes, that's right. There's something of a race going on with this in the world of astronomy. And um, Australia does pretty well at it, actually. I can remember back in the 1980s when, you know, almost every week it seemed we discovered a more distant object. They were usually quasars. And so the, re- the record for the most distant object known to humankind kept tumbling. And it's a little bit like that with the oldest star. We see these things come up and then a few months later there's another one that's even older. It's Mick Jagger by the way. (laughs) I know a few that are older than that. (laughs) (laughs) Just to clarify, when we look deep into the sky, you're always looking back in time. You can imagine a situation where you're going to be looking back at really ancient galaxies. And in fact, there are some in which you can see individual stars because of things like gravitational lensing, which means that you are seeing stars very early in the history of the universe. But what we're talking about here is not that. It's not the looking back in time trick. It is the ability to see stars in our neighbourhood, which have evidence of being very ancient. And The way you pick that out is by a a star having strange colours. And that's how the Australian, it's actually called the Sky Mapper Telescope, run by the Australian National University at Siding Spring Observatory near Coonabarabran. Sky Mapper is great for doing that because it's got a whole array of filters and it can take images of the sky, really detailed images of the sky, looking through these different filters. And that allows scientists to say, well, Here's a candidate for an old star. But that's not enough. What you then have to do is go and follow it up with a bigger telescope, one that will allow you to look at the spectrum of the star, the the rainbow spectrum, and to see this barcode of information that's superimposed on the spectrum. A barcode's a really good analogy because when we look at the spectrum of a star, it's exactly what we see. And the, the black lines on the barcode equate to what we call absorption lines. They're essentially the fingerprints of different elements in the star's atmosphere. So the most abundant element in the atmospheres of stars is hydrogen, because that's what the universe started off as. Mm. And what happened in the very early universe, there was nothing else. Actually, there was helium as well, but hydrogen and helium were the only things substantially that were there in the early universe there were trace elements of a couple of other things but that's not important in this context and the first generation of stars the earliest ones to form would have basically not much more than hydrogen in their spectrum probably a bit of helium because it was in the interiors of those stars that the other elements formed you know the silicon the oxygen the carbon the iron all of those things are formed inside stars and that first generation of stars would give rise to some of these heavier elements. And then because we believe the first generation of stars were very massive, they lived for short lives measured in tens of millions of years rather than billions of years like our sun. Those massive stars would all have ended in a supernova explosion, which blows the debris from which they are made, or at least the atmosphere, the debris from which the atmosphere is made, out into the wild blue yonder, which in this case means the interstellar medium, the the space between the stars. And what that does is then provides raw materials for subsequent generations of stars to form. I was going to ask if they feed upon themselves and recreate accordingly. So each generation of stars 
builds on what went before it and their atmospheres are enriched by all these atoms that have been created in the previous generations of stars. So if you want to find a very old star, what you need to look for is something that's got very little in it other than hydrogen and helium, very little in its spectrum. And that's basically what has happened with this particular star. I've got to tell you what it's called. Oh, Andrew. please. This one's a cracker. J160540.18 <laughs> minus 144323.1. And I forgot that its its prefix is SMSS. SMSS, I think, just stands for Sky Mapper Sky Survey, probably. So that's basically what we've got. And that particular star, whose name I'm not going to say again, turns out to have virtually nothing in it other than hydrogen and helium. The one thing that is in it, which is a kind of gauge as to how old it is, and this is really the, the yardstick by which these old stars are judged, what is in it is iron. And iron content is a measure of how early a star has appeared in the history of the universe. This one has an iron content of one part per 50 billion. So it's very, very sparse in iron. Its iron content is a record low. That's the, the bottom line. So that's what the published paper will say it's got uh, in fact they describe them as ultra metal poor these these stars and a metal by the way to an astronomer is everything except hydrogen and helium i know that sounds bizarre but we think of you know even oxygen and carbon and things like that as metals that aside this star is very very poor in iron and that places it in the record books as being, at the moment, the oldest known star. But watch this face, because in a couple of months there'll be another one that's even older. I suppose. You so know, do, it, where, where is it? Do we Can we point at it? it? Yes, it, it's in the Milky Way galaxy. It's actually in the halo of our galaxy. That means that not the disk of the galaxy, but there is a spherical fairly rarefied distribution of stars around the galaxy. We call it the halo, and that's where it is. It's about 35,000 light years away as the crow flies, so a rather distant object, but still in our galaxy. That's Dr. Fred Watson, an astronomer with the Department of Science, speaking with Andrew Dunkley on our sister program, Space Nuts. And this is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. A small experimental Chinese space station, really just an orbital laboratory, has burnt up during atmospheric re-entry. The Tiangong-2, or Heavenly Palace-2, was launched into orbit back in 2016 for what was planned to be a two-year lifespan. Amazingly, the orbiting outpost remained operational for over a thousand days. It was designed to allow visiting Taikonauts to practice docking techniques and experience long-duration spaceflight. It also tested new technologies needed for a permanent Chinese space station slated for launch in 2022. Beijing says Tiangong-2's re-entry went smoothly, with most of the spacecraft burning up in the atmosphere and the remains splashing down on target in the eastern South Pacific Ocean west of Chile. And that must have been a relief for Beijing after the disaster of its Tiangong-1 predecessor, which fell back to Earth in a widely tumbling death plunge in 2018 after Beijing lost all control and communications with the orbiting outpost. Beijing was widely criticised over that, not for losing control, these things happen, but for keeping the threat posed by the 8.5-ton out-of-control spacecraft a secret in order to try and save its self-embarrassment. And time now to take another brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with the Science Report. A new study has cast doubt on the ability of vitamin D supplements to protect people from diabetes. The findings, reported in the New England Journal of Medicine, suggest people at high risk of type 2 diabetes are unlikely to lower their risk by taking vitamin D supplements. Previous research suggested an association between low vitamin D levels and the risk of type 2 diabetes. But the new study says there was no difference in the risk factor between those people taking the supplements and those taking a placebo. Overfishing and warmer waters due to global warming may be combining to increase levels of mercury in seafood. A report in the journal Nature suggests that warming oceans and changing diet due to overfishing could be increasing the levels of methylmercury in some fish species. Scientists warn that popular fish foods such as cod and tuna are some of the worst affected, with mercury concentrations in Atlantic cod increasing by up to 23% since the 1970s. Scientists are also warning that temperatures could contribute to an estimated 56% increase in methylmercury in Atlantic bluefin tuna. 
The authors say the increase exists despite a decrease in the concentration of the toxin in seawater since the late 1990s. Paleontologists have discovered the fossilised remains of what's now thought to be the world's largest ever parrot, a massive squawkzilla standing a metre tall. The bird, uncovered from 19-million-year-old rocks in New Zealand's central Otago region, is the first extinct giant parrot ever found. Scientists from Flinders University, the University of New South Wales and New Zealand's Canterbury Museum have named the new discovery Heracles inexpectatus to reflect the Herculean myth-like size and strength and the unexpected nature of the find. A new study warns that one of Australia's most unique monotremes, the platypus, is in far greater danger than people realise. A report by the University of New South Wales has found that declines in platypus numbers have been underestimated. The iconic species was listed as near-threatened in 2016, given mounting evidence of recent localised declines. The new findings, reported in the journal Global Ecology and Conservation, are based on all the available data on platypus distribution and abundance over the past 258 years, compared to more recent data from systematic surveys. The study shows that platypus declines have been significantly underestimated. And changes to the species distribution are also concerning. In fact, 41.4% of subcatchments across the platypus range had no recorded sightings in the last 10 years. It's thought these long-term declines likely reflect the impact of the historical fur trade from which platypus never fully recovered. Subsequent impacts from river regulation, habitat destruction, pollution, predation and drowning in enclosed fish and crustacean nets has further increased their decline. Of particular concern is the Murray-Darling Basin, where 50% of subcatchments where platypus once occurred had no recorded sightings in the last 10 years. Road workers expanding a highway on the outskirts of Jerusalem have discovered a hoard of 2,000-year-old ancient coins. Archaeologists from the Israeli Antiquities Authority say the 114 coins discovered all date back to the Great Jewish Revolt against the Roman Empire. The coins all bear identical markings, on one side a chalice with the Hebrew words to the redemption of Zion, and on the other side some Jewish symbols and the words year 4, indicating they were forged during the fourth year of the revolt, which was around the year 69 or 70. The Great Jewish Revolt was the culmination of a long series of ongoing clashes by the region's local Jewish inhabitants and Roman Empire. Roman forces eventually overpowered the Jews, murdering two million of them and destroying the temple on August the 29th in the year 70. The million or so Jews that survived slaughter during the Roman conquest were then expelled from Israel, which had been their homeland since the days of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob some 4,000 years ago. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary, and that's the show for now. You can subscribe and download Space Time as a free twice-weekly podcast through Apple Podcast iTunes, Stitcher, Bytes.com, Pocket Casts, SoundCloud, YouTube, Audioboom, from SpacetimeWithStuartGary.com, or from your favorite podcast download provider. Space Time's also broadcast coast-to-coast across the United States on Science360 Radio by the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C., and available around the world on TuneIn Radio. If you want more Space Time, check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word and in lowercase, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us on Twitter through at Stuart Gary, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram, and on Facebook, just go to www.facebook.com slash Spacetime with Stuart Gary. Spacetime is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Spacetime with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 